Section number 35 of The Golden Gems of Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The Golden Gems of Life by Emery Adams Allen and S. C. Ferguson. Section 35. Frugality. Frugality may be termed the daughter of prudence, the sister of temperance, and the parent of liberty and ease. It is synonymous with economy, and is a sound understanding brought into action. It is calculation realized. It is the doctrine of proportion adduced to practice. It is foreseeing contingencies and providing against them. Its other and less reputable sisters are avarice and prodigality. She alone keeps the straight and safe path, while avarice sneers at her as profuse, and prodigality scorns at her as penurious to the poor she is indispensable to those of moderate means she is found representative of wisdom joined to industry and sobriety she is a better outfit to business than a dowry she conducts her votaries to competence and honor while profuseness is a cruel and crafty demon that gradually involves her followers in dependence and debt frugality shyness in her best light when joined to liberality the first consists in leaving off superfluous expense the last is bestowing them to the benefit of those that need the first without the last begets covetousness the last without the first begets prodigality there is ever a golden mean between frugality and stinginess or closeness he that spareth in everything is an excusable niggard he that spareth in nothing is an inexcusable madman the golden mean of frugality is to spare in what is least necessary and to lay out more liberally in what is most required in our several circumstances it is no man's duty to deny himself every amusement every recreation every comfort that he may get rich it is no man's duty to make an iceberg of himself and to deny himself the enjoyment that results from his generous actions merely that he may hoard wealth for his heirs to quarrel about. But there is an economy which is especially commendable in the man who struggles with poverty, and is every man's duty, an economy which is consistent with happiness, and which must be practiced if the poor man would secure independence when one is blessed with good sense and fair opportunities this spirit of economy is one of the most beneficial of all secular gifts and takes high rank among the minor virtues it is by this mysterious power that the loaf is multiplied that using does not waste that little becomes much that scattered fragments grow to unity and that out of nothing or next to nothing comes the miracle of something frugality is not merely saving still less parsimony it is foresight and combination it is insight and arrangement it is a subtle philosophy of things by which new uses new compositions are discovered it causes inert things to labor useless things to serve our necessities perishing things to renew their vigor and all things to exert themselves for human comfort 
as the acquisition of knowledge depends more upon what a man remembers than upon the quantity of his reading so the acquisition of property depends more upon what is saved than upon what is earned the largest reservoir though fed by abundant and living springs will fail to supply their owners with water if secret leaking places are permitted to drain off their contents in like manner though by his skill and energy a man may convert his business into a flowing pactolus ever depositing its golden sands in his coffers yet through the numerous wants of unfrugal habits he may live embarrassed and die poor economy is the guardian of property the good genius whose presence guides the footsteps of every prosperous and successful man either a man must be content with poverty all of his life or else be willing to deny himself some luxuries and save to lay the base of independence in the future but if a man defies the future and spends all that he earns whether it be much or little let him look for lean and hungry want at some future time for it will surely come no matter what he thinks to economize and be frugal is absolutely the only way to get a solid fortune there is no other certain mode on earth those who shut their eyes and ears to those plain facts will be forever poor. Fortune does not give way her real and substantial goods. She sells them to the highest bidder, to the hardest, wisest worker for the boon. Men never make so fatal a mistake as when they think they are mere creatures of fate. It is the sheerest folly in the world every man may make or mar his life whichever he may choose fortune is for those who by diligence honesty and frugality place themselves in a position to grasp hold of fortune when it appears in view simple industry and thrift will go far towards making any person of ordinary working faculties comparatively independent in his means almost any working man may be so provided he will carefully husband his resources and watch the little outlets of useless expenditures a penny is a very small matter yet the comfort of thousands of families depends upon the proper saving and spending of pennies if a man allows the little pennies the results of his hard work to slip out of his fingers he will find that his life is little raised above one of mere animal drudgery one way in which true economy is shown consists in living within one's income this is the grand element of success in acquiring property to carry it out requires resolution self-denial self-reliance but it must be done or grinding poverty will accompany you through life we urge upon all young men who are just starting in life to make it an invariable rule to lay aside a certain proportion of their income whatever that income may be extravagant expenditures occasion a large part of the suffering of a great majority of people and extravagance is wholly a relative term what is not at all extravagant for one person may be very much so for another expenditures no matter how small in themselves they may be are always extravagant when they come fully up to the entire amount of a person's income on every hand we see people living on credit putting off payday to the last making in the end some desperate effort generally by borrowing to scrape the money together 
and then struggling on again with the canker of care eating at their hearts but their exertions are vain they land at last in the inevitable goal of bankruptcy if they would only be content to make the push in the beginning instead of the end they would save themselves all this misery the great secret of being solvent and well-to-do and comfortable is to get ahead of your expenses eat and drink this month what you earned last month not what you are going to earn next month it is unsafe to draw drafts on the future for hope is deceitful and your paper is liable to go to protest when one is once weighed down with a load of debt he loses the sense of being free and independent the man with his fine house his glittering carriage and his rich banquets for which he is in debt is a slave a prisoner dragging his chains behind him through all the grandeur of the false world through which he moves in urging a course of strict economy we admit that it is hard embarrassing perplexing onerous but it is by no means impractical a cool survey of one's expenditures compared with his income a wise balancing of ends to be gained a firm and calm determination to break with custom wherever it is opposed to good sense and a patience that does not chafe at small and gradual results will do much towards establishing the principle of economy and securing its benefits economy has however deeper roots than even this in the desires it is there after all that we control our expenditures as a general rule we may be sure that we shall spend our money for what we most earnestly crave if it be luxury and display then it will melt into costly viands and soft clothing handsome dwellings and rich furniture if on the other hand our desires are for higher enjoyments or for benevolent purposes our money will flow into these channels every one then who cherishes in himself or excites in others a desire more pure and noble than existed before who draws the heart from the craving of sense to those of soul from self to others from what is low sensual and wrong to what is pure elevating and right in so far establishes on the firmness of all foundations a wise economy a true economy appears to induce the exertion of almost every laudable emotion a strict regard to honesty a laudable spirit of independence a judicious presence in providing for the wants and a steady benevolence in preparing for the claims of the future such an economy can but appeal to the good sense of all who candidly ponder over life and its realities to spend all that you acquire as soon as you gain it is to lead a butterfly existence were you always to be young and free from sickness and care and life were to pass as one perpetual summer it would do no harm to so live but care will come sickness may strike you at any time and if you escape these yet you know life has its autumnal and winter seasons as well as its summer and alas for the veteran who finds himself obliged to learn in his latter years the lessons of strict economy for the first time having lived in utter defiance of them in the season of youth and strength end of section thirty five recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c
Section 36 of The Golden Gems of Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The Golden Gems of Life by Emery Adams Allen and S. C. Ferguson. Section 36. Patience. Patience is the ballast of the soul that will keep it from rolling and tumbling in the greatest storms. All life is but one vast representation of the beauty and value of patience. Troubles and sorrows are in store for all. It is useless to try to escape them, and indeed it is well we cannot as they seem essential to the perfection and development of character into its highest and best form. But their disciplinary value arises from the great lesson of patience they are constantly inculating. Either patience must be a quality graciously inherent in the heart of man, or it must be acquired as the lesson of years experience if he would enjoy the greatest good of life without it prosperity will be continually disturbed and adversity will be clouded with double darkness the loud complaint the querulous temper and fretful spirit disgrace every character we weaken thereby the sympathy of others and estrange them from offices of kindness and comfort but to maintain a steady and unbroken mind amidst all the shocks of adversity forms the highest honor of man afflictions supported by patience and surmounted by fortitude give the last finishing stroke to the heroic and virtuous character patience produces unity in the church loyalty in the state harmony in families and societies she comforts the poor and moderates the rich she makes us humble in prosperity cheerful in adversity unmoved by calumny and above reproach she teaches us to forgive those who have injured us and to be the first in asking the forgiveness of those whom we have injured she delights the faithful and invites the unbelieving she adorns the woman and approves the man she is beautiful in either sex and every age patience has been defined as the courage of virtue the principle which enables us to lessen the paths of mind or body an emotion that does not so much add to the number of our joys as it tends to diminish the number of our sufferings if life is made to abound with pains and troubles by the errors and the crimes of man it is no small advantage to have a faculty that enables us to soften these pains and ameliorate the, these troubles he that has patience can have what he will there is no road too long to the man who advances deliberately and without undue haste there are no honors too distinct for the man who prepares himself for them with patience nature herself abounds with examples of patience day follows the murkiest night and when the time comes the latest fruits also ripen its most beneficent operations and those which take place on a grand scale are the results of patience the great works of human power achieved by the hand of genius are but eloquent examples of what may be achieved by the exercise of this virtue history and biography abound with examples of signal patience shown by great men under trying circumstances in the pursuit of worldly success patience or a willingness to bide one's time 
is no less necessary as a factor than perseverance says de mastery to know how to wait is the great secret of success and of all the lessons that humanity teaches in this school of the world the hardest is to wait not to wait with folded hands the claim life's prizes without previous effort but having toiled and struggled and crowded the slow years with trial to see then no results or perhaps disastrous results and yet to stand firm to preserve one's poise and relax no effort this it has been truly said is greatness whether achieved by man or woman the world cannot be circumnavigated by one wind the grandest results cannot be achieved in a day the fruits that are best worth plucking usually ripen the most slowly and therefore every one who would gain a solid success must learn to labor and to wait what a world of meaning in those few words and how many are possessed of the moral courage to live in that state it is the tendency of the times to be in a hurry when there is any object to be accomplished in the pursuit of riches it is only the exceptional persons who are content with slow gains willing to acquire wealth by adding penny to penny dollar to dollar the mass of business men are too apt to despise such a tedious and laborious means of ascent and they rush headlong into schemes for the sudden acquisition of wealth or in the field of professional life we are too prone to forget there is no royal road to great acquirements and feel an unwillingness to lay broad and deep by years of patient study and laborious research the foundation whereon to build an enduring monument worthy of public credit and renown the history of all who are honored in the world of literature arts or science is the history of patient study for years and its final triumph elio burritt says all that i have accomplished or spect or hope to accomplish has been and will be by that patient preserving process of accreditation which builds the ant heap particle by particle thought by thought fact by fact labor still is and ever will be the inevitable price set upon everything which is valuable hence if we would acquire wisdom we must diligently apply ourselves and confront the same continuous application which our forefathers did we must be satisfied to work energetically with a purpose and wait the results with patience all progress of the best kind is slow but to him who works faithfully and in a right spirit be sure that the reward will be vouchsafed in its own good time courage must have sunk in despair and the world must have remained unimproved and unornamented if man had merely compared the effect of a single stroke of the chisel with the pyramid to be raised or of a single impression of the spade with the mountain to be leveled we must continuously apply ourselves to right pursuits and we cannot fail to advance steadily though it may be unconsciously in all evils which admit a remedy impatience should be avoided because it wastes that time and attention in complaints that if properly applied might remove the cause in cases that admit of no remedy it is worse than useless to give way to impatience both because of the utter uselessness of doing as well as that 
the time thus spent could be better employed in the furtherance of useful designs since then these two classes of ills comprise all to which human nature is subject why not make a determined struggle against impatience in every form it accomplishes nothing that is of value divides our efforts frustrates our plans and generally succeeds in making our lives miserable not only to ourselves but to all around us how much of home happiness and comfort depends upon the exercise of patience not a day passes but calls for its exercise from those who sustain the nearest and dearest relations to each other let patience have her perfect work in the home circle let parents be patient with their children they are weak and you are strong they stand at the eastern gate of life experience has not taught them to speak carefully and to go softly what if their plays and amusements do great upon your nerves bear with them patiently care and time will soon enough check their childish impulses be patient with your friends they are neither omniscient nor omnipotent they cannot see your heart and may misunderstand you they do not know what is best for you and may select what is worst what if also they lack purity of purpose or tenacity of affection do not you lack these graces patience is your refuge endure and in enduring conquer them and if not them then at least yourself be patient with pains and cares these things are killed by enduring them but made strong to bite and sting by feeding them with your frets and fears there is no pain or cure that can last long none of them shall enter the city of god a little while and you shall leave behind you all your troubles and forget in your first hour of rest that such things were on earth above all be patient with your beloved love is the best thing on earth but it is to be handled tenderly and impatience is the nurse that kills it try to smooth life's weary way each for the other and in the exercise of the heaven-born virtue of patience you will find the sweetest pleasure of life End of section 36. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Section 37 of The Golden Gems of Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The Golden Gems of Life by Emery Adams Allen and S.C. Ferguson. Section 37. Self-Control. Self-control is the highest form of courage. It is the base of all the virtues. It is one of the most important but one of the most difficult things for a powerful mind to be its own master if he reigns within himself and rules passions desires and fears he is more than a king too often self-control is made to mean only the control of angry passions but that is simply one form of self-control in another a higher and more complete sense it means the control over all the passions appetites and impulses true wisdom ever seeks to restrain one from blindly following his own impulses and appetites even those who are moral and intellectual as well as those which are animal and sensual 
in the supremacy of self-control consists one of the perfections of the ideal man not to be impulsive not to be spurred hither and thither by each desire that in turn comes uppermost but to be self-restrained self-balanced governed by the joint decision of the feelings in council assembled before whom every action shall have been fully debated and calmly determined this is true strength and wisdom mankind are endowed by the creator with qualities which raise them infinitely higher in the scale of importance than any other members of the animal world they are given reason as a guide to follow rather than instinct but if men give the reins to their impulses and passions from that moment they surrender this high prerogative they are carried along the current of their life and become the slaves of the strongest desires for the time being to be morally free to be more than an animal man must be able to resist instinctive impulses this can only be done by the exercise of self-control thus it is this power that constitutes the real distinction between a physical and a moral life and that forms the primary basis of individual character nine-tenths of the vicious desires that degrade society and the crimes that disgrace it would shrink into insignificance before the advance of valiant self-discipline self-respect and self-control it is necessary to one's personal happiness to exercise control over his words as well as his acts for there are words that strike even harder than blows and men may speak daggers even though they use none character exhibits itself in control of speech as much as in any thing else the wise and forbearant men will restrain his desire to say a smart or severe thing at the expense of another's feelings while the fool speaks out what he thinks and will sacrifice his friend rather than his joke there are men who are headlong in their language as in their actions because of the want of forbearance and self-restraining patience government is at the bottom of all progress the state or nation that has the best government progresses most so the individual who governs best himself makes the most rapid progress the native energies of the human soul presses it to activity controlled they bear it forward in right paths uncontrolled they urge it on to probable destruction no man is free who has not the command over himself but allows his appetites or his temper to control him and to triumph over these is of all conquests the most glorious he who is enslaved to his passions is worse governed than athens was by her thirty tyrants he who indulges his sense in any excess renders himself obnoxious to his own reason and to gratify the brute in him displeases the man and sets his two natures at variance we ought not to sacrifice the sentiments of the soul to gratify the appetites of the body passions are excellent servants and when properly trained and disciplined are capable of being applied to noble purposes but when allowed to become masters they are dangerous in the extreme to resist strong impulses to subdue powerful passions to silence the voice of vehement desire is a strong and noble virtue and the virtue rises in height beauty and grandeur in proportion to the strength of the impulses subdued true virtue is not always visible to the gaze of the world it is often still and calm composure is often the highest result of power and there are seasons when 
to be still demands immeasurably higher strength than to act think you it demands no power to calm the stormy elements of passions to throw off the load of dejection to repass every repining though when the dearest hopes are withered and to turn the wounded spirit from dangerous reveries and wasting grief to the quiet discharge of ordinary duties is there no power put forth when a man stripped of his property of the fruits of a life's labor quells discontent and gloomy forebodings and serenely and patiently returns to the task which providence assigns we doubt not that the all-seeing eye of god sometimes discerns the sublimest human energy under a form of countenance which by their composure and tranquillity indicate to the human spectator only passive virtues individuals who have attained such power are among the great ones of earth strength of character consists in two things power of will and power of self-restraint it requires two things therefore for its existence strong feelings and strong command over them oft times we mistake strong feelings for strong character he is not a strong man who bears all before him at whose frown domestics tremble and the children of the household quake on the contrary he is a weak man it is his passions that are strong he mastered by them is weak you must measure the strength of a man by the power of the feelings he subdues not by the power of those that subdue him did we ever see a man receive a flagrant injury and then reply calmly that is a man spiritually strong or did we ever see a man in anguish stand as if carved out of solid rock mastering himself or one bearing a hopeless daily trial remain silent and never tell the world what cankered his peace that is strength he who with strong passions remains chaste he who keenly sensitive with many powers of indignation in him can be provoked and yet restrain himself and forgive these are strong men the spiritual heroes a strong temper is not necessarily a bad temper but the stronger the temper the greater is the need of self-discipline and self-control strong temper may only mean a strong and excitable will uncontrolled it displays itself in fitful outbreaks of passion but controlled and held in subjection like steam pent up within the mechanism of a steam engine it becomes the source of energetic power and usefulness some of the greatest characters in history have been men of strong tempers but with equal strength of determination to hold their motive power under strict regulation and control he is usually a moral weakling who has no strong desires or strong temper to overcome but he who with these fails to subdue them is speedily ruined by them man is born for domination but he must enter it by conquest and continue to battle for every inch of ground added to his sway his infant exertions are put forth to establish the authority of his will over his physical powers his after efforts are for the subjection of the will to the judgment there are times which come to all of us when our will is not completely fashioned to our hands and the restless passions of the mind hold us in sway seasons when all of us do and say things which are unbecoming unseemly and which lower and debase us in the opinion of others and also of ourselves self-control however is a virtue 
which will become ours if we cultivate it properly if we strive right manfully for its possession fight a bitter warfare against irritability nervousness jealousy and all unkindness of heart and soul but it must be cultivated properly one exercise of it will not win us the victory we must by constant repetition of efforts obtain at last the victory which will bring us repose which will enable us to say to the raging waves of passion thus far canst thou come and no farther we must be faithful to ourselves faithful in our watch and ward over tongue eye and hand it is only by so doing that man comes to the full development of its powers it is alike the duty and the birthright of man moderation in all things and regulating the actions only by the judgment are the most eminent parts of wisdom he that ruleth his own spirit is greater than he that taketh a city End of section 37. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Section 38 of The Golden Gems of Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The Golden Gems of Life by Emery Adams Allen and S.C. Ferguson Section 38 Courage Pray thee peace, I dare do all that may become a man. Who dares do more is none. Shakespeare Courage consists not in hazarding without fear, but being resolutely minded in a just cause. The brave man is not he who feels no fear, for that were stupid and irrational, but he whose noble soul subdues its fears, and bravely dares the danger nature shrinks from. True courage is cool and calm. The bravest of men have the least of a brutal, bullying insolence, and in the very time of danger are found the most serene and free. Rage can make a coward forget himself and fight, but what is done in fury or anger can never be placed to the account of courage. Courage enlarges, cowardice diminishes resources. In desperate straits, the fears of the timid aggravate the dangers that imperil the brave. For cowards the road of desertion should be kept open. They will carry over to the enemy nothing but their fears. The poltroon, like the scabbard, is an encumbrance when once the sword is drawn. It is the same in the everyday battles of life. To believe a business impossible is the way to make it so. How many feasible projects have miscarried through despondency, and been strangled in the birth by a cowardly imagination? It is better to meet danger than to wait for it. A ship on a lee shore stands out to sea in a storm to escape shipwreck. Impossibilities, like vicious dogs, fly before him who is not afraid of them should misfortune overtake retrench work harder but never fly the track confront difficulties with unflinching perseverance should you then fail you will be honored but shrink and you will be despised when you put your hands to a work let the fact of your doing so constitute the evidence that you mean to prosecute it to the end. They that fear and overthrow are half conquered. 
no one can tell who the heroes are and who the cowards until some crisis comes to put us to the test and no crisis puts us to the test that does not bring us up alone and single-handed to face danger it is comparatively nothing to make a rush with the multitude even into the jaws of destruction sheep will do that armies can be picked from the gutters and marched up as food for powder but when some crisis singles one out from the multitude pointing at him the particular finger of fate and telling him stand or run and he faces about with steady nerve with nobody else to stand behind we may be sure the hero stuff is in him when such crises come the true courage is just as likely to be found in people of shrinking nerves or in weak and timid women as in great burly people it is a moral not a physical trait its seat is not in the temperament but the will some people imagine that courage is confined to the field of battle there could be no greater mistake even contentious men unavoidably contentious are not by any means limited to the battlefield and there are other struggles with adverse circumstances struggles it may be with habits or appetites or passions all of which require as much courage and more perseverance than the brief encounter of battle enough to contend with enough to overcome lies in the pathway of every individual it may be one kind of difficulties or may be another but plenty of difficulties of some kind or another every one may be sure of finding through life there is but one way of looking at fate whatever that may be whether blessings or afflictions to behave with dignity under both we must not lose heart or it will be the worst both for ourselves and for those whom we love to struggle and again and again to renew the conflict this is life's inheritance he who never falters no matter how adverse may be the circumstances always enjoys the consciousness of a perpetual spiritual triumph of which nothing can deprive him though the occasions of high heroic daring seldom occur but in the history of the great the less obtrusive opportunities for the exercise of private energy are continually offering themselves with these domestic scenes as much abound as does the tented field pain may be as firmly endured in the lonely chamber as amid the din of arms difficulties can be manfully combated misfortune bravely sustained poverty nobly supported disappointments courageously encountered thus courage diffuses a wide and succoring influence and bestows energy a portion to the trial it takes from calamity its dejecting quality and enables the soul to possess itself under every vicissitude it rescues the unhappy from degradation and the feeble from contempt the greater part of the courage that is needed in the world is not of a heroic kind there needs the common courage to be honest the courage to resist temptation the courage to speak the truth the courage to be what we really are and not to pretend to be what we are not the courage to live honestly within our own means and not dishonestly upon the means of others the courage that dares to display itself in silent effort and endeavor that dares to endure all and suffer all for truth and duty is more truly heroic 
than the achievements of physical valor which are rewarded by honors and titles or by laurels sometimes steeped in blood it is moral courage that characterizes the highest order of manhood and womanhood intellectual intrepidity is one of the vital conditions of independence and self-reliance of character a man must have the courage to be himself and not the shadow or the echo of another he must exercise his own powers thinking his own thoughts and speak his own sentiments he must elaborate his own opinions and form his own convictions it has been said that he who dares not form an opinion must be a coward he who will not must be an idler he who can not must be a fool every enlargement of the domain of knowledge which has made us better acquainted with the heavens with the earth and with ourselves has been established by the energy the devotion the self-sacrifice and the courage of the great spirits of past times who however much they may have been oppressed or reviled by their contemporaries now rank among those whom the enlightened of the human race most delight to honor the passive endurance of the man or woman who for conscience's sake is found ready to suffer and endure in solitude without so much as the encouragement of even a single sympathizing voice is an exhibition of courage of a far higher kind than that displayed in the roar of battle where even the weakest feels encouraged and inspired by the enthusiasm of sympathy and the power of numbers time would fail to tell of the names of those who through faith in principles and in the face of difficulties dangers and sufferings have fought a good fight in the moral warfare of the world and being content to lay down their lives rather than prove false to their conscientious convictions of the truth the patriot who fights an always losing battle the martyr who goes to death amid the triumphant shouts of his enemies the discoverer like columbus whose heart remains undaunted through years of failure are examples of the moral sublime which excites a profounder interest in the hearts of men than even the most complete and conspicuous success by the side of such instances as these how small by comparison seems the greatest deeds of valor inciting men to rush upon death and die amid the frenzied excitement of physical warfare end of section thirty eight recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c section thirty nine of the golden gems of life this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c the golden gems of life by emory adams allen and s c ferguson section thirty nine charity the primal duties shine aloft like stars the charities that soothe and heal and bless lie scattered at the feet of man like flowers woodsworth charity like the dew from heaven falls gently on the drooping flowers in the stillness of night its refreshing and reviving effects are felt seen and admired it flows from a good heart and looks beyond the skies for approval and reward 
it never opens but seeks to heal the wounds inflicted by misfortune it never harrows up but strives to calm the troubled mind charity is another name for disinterested love the humane sympathetic feeling that which seeks the good of others that which would pour out from the treasures of its multifiance gifts of good things upon all it is that feeling that gave the world a howard a fenelon a fry it is that feeling that leads on the reformer which inspires the philanthropist which blesses and curses not it is the good samaritan of the heart it is that which thinketh no evil and is kind which hopeth all things believeth all things endureth all things it is the angel of mercy which forgives seventy and seven times and still is rich in the treasures of pardon it visits the sick soothes the pillow of the dying drops a tear with the mourner buries the dead cares for the orphan it delights to do offices of good to those cast down to relieve the suffering of the oppressed and distressed to proclaim the gospel to the poor its words are more precious than rubies its voice is sweeter than honey its hand is softer than down its step as gentle as love whoever would be respected and beloved whoever would be useful and remembered with pleasure when life is over must cherish this virtue whoever would be truly happy and feel the real charms of goodness must cultivate this affection it becomes if possible more glorious when we consider the number and extent of its objects it is as wide as the world of suffering deep as the heart of sorrow extensive as the wants of creation and boundless as the kingdom of need its spirit is the messenger of peace holding out to quarreling humanity the flag of truce it is needed everywhere in all times and places in all trades professions and callings of profit or honor which men can pursue in the home life there is too often a lack of charity it should be considered as a sacred duty to long and well cultivate it to exercise it daily and to guard well its growth the peace and happiness of the world depends greatly upon it nothing gives a sweeter charm to youth than an act of charity a disposition kind to all who can properly estimate the powers and sweetness of an active charity he who carries with him the spirit of boundless charity to man often does good when he knows not of it an influence seems to go forth from him which soothes the distressed encourages the drooping simulates afresh the love of virtue and begets his own image and likeness in all beholders without the exercise of this grace it is impossible to make domestic and social life delightful deeds and words of conventional courtesy grown familiar are comparatively empty forms the charitable soul carries with it a charmed atmosphere of peace and love breathing which all who come within its benign influence unfold their noblest qualities and develop their most amiable traits inharmonious influences are neutralized the harsh discipline of life is changed to wholesome training the crooked places are made straight and the rough smooth the uncharitable and censorious are generally found among the narrow and bigoted and those who have never read the full page of their own heart or been subject to various and crucial tests how can a man whose temper is 
diplomatic judge justly of him whose blood is fiery whose nature is tropical and whose passions mount in an instant and as quickly subside how can one in the seclusion of private life accurately measure the force of the influence those are subjected to who live and act in the center of vast and powerful civil and social circles the more you mix with men the less you will be disposed to quarrel and the more charitable and liberal you will become the fact that you do not understand another is quite as likely to be your fault as his there are many chances in favor of the conclusion that when you feel a lack of charitable feeling it is through your own ignorance and illiberality this will disappear as your knowledge of men grows more and more complete hence keep your heart open for everybody and be sure that you shall have your reward you will find a jewel under the most uncouth exterior and associated with comeliness manners and the oddest ways and the ugliest faces you will find rare virtues fragrant little humanities and inspiring heroisms how glorious the thought of the universal triumph of charity how grand and comprehensive the theme the subject commands the profound attention of good men and of angels under the direful influence of its agnostic principle man has trampled upon the rights of fellow man and waded through rivers of human blood to satisfy his thirst for vengeance its footsteps have been marked with the blood of slaughtered millions its power has shivered kingdoms and destroyed empires when men shall be brought into subjection to the law of charity the angel of peace will take up its abode with the children of men wars and rumors of wars will cease envy and revenge will hide their diminished heads falsehood and slander will be unknown sectarian walls will crumble to dust then this world will be transformed into a paradise in which everything that is beautiful and lovely shall grow and bloom disinterested and benevolent acts will abound sorrow and disappointments will flee away and peace sunshine and joy will beautify and adorn life death always makes a beautiful appeal to charity when we look upon the dead form so composed and still the kindness and the love that are in us all come forth the grave covers every error buries every defect extinguishes every resentment from its peaceful bosom spring none but fond regrets and tender recollections who can look upon the grave even of an enemy and not feel a compunctuous throb that he should ever have warred with the poor handful of dust that lies mouldering before him charity stowed away in the heart like rose leaves in a drawer sweetens all the daily acts of life little drops of rain brighten the meadow acts of charity brighten the world we can conceive of nothing more attractive than the heart when filled with the spirit of charity certainly nothing so embellishes human nature as the practice of this virtue a sentiment so genial and so excellent ought to be emblazoned upon every thought and act of our life this principle underlies the whole theory of christianity and in no other person do we find it more happily exemplified than in the life of our saviour who while on earth went about doing good end of section thirty nine recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c
Section number 40 of The Golden Gems of Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The Golden Gems of Life by Emery Adams Allen and S.C. Ferguson section 40 kindness kindness is the music of goodwill to men and on this harp the smallest fingers in the world may play heaven's sweetest tunes on earth kindness is one of the purest traits that find a place in the human heart it gives us friends whenever we may chance to wander whether we dwell with the savage tribes of the forest or with civilized races kindness is a language understood by the former as well as the latter its influence never ceases started once it flows onward like the little mountain rivulet in a pure and increasing stream to show kindness it is not necessary to give large sums of money or to perform some wonderful deed that will immortalize your name it is the tear dropped with the mother as she weeps over the bier of her departed child it is the word of sympathy to the discouraged and the disheartened the cup of cold water and the slice of bread to the hungry one kindness makes sunshine wherever it goes it finds its way into the hidden chambers of the heart and brings forth golden treasures which harshness would have sealed up forever kindness makes the mother's lullaby sweeter than the song of the lark and renders the careworn brow of the father and man of business less severe in its expression it is the water of leth to the laborer who straightway forgets his weariness born of the burden and heat of the day kindness is the real law of life the link that connects earth with heaven the true philosopher's stone for all it touches it turns into virgin gold the true gold wherewith we purchase contentment peace and love would you live in the remembrance of others after you shall have passed away write your name on the tablets of their hearts by acts of kindness love and mercy kindness is an emotion of which we ought never to feel ashamed graceful especially in youth is the tear of sympathy and the heart that melts at the tale of woe we should not permit ease and indulgence to contract our affection and wrap us up in a selfish enjoyment but we should accustom ourselves to think of the distresses of human life and how to relieve them think of the solitary cottage the dying parent and the weeping child a tender-hearted and compassionate disposition which inclines men to pity and to feel the misfortunes of others as its own is of all dispositions the most amiable and though it may not receive much honor is worthy of the highest kindness is the very principle of love an emanation of the heart which softens and gladdens and should be inculcated and encouraged in all our intercourse with our fellow beings kindness does not consist in gifts but in gentleness and generosity of spirit men may give their money which comes from their purse and withhold their kindness which comes from their heart the kindness which displays itself in giving money does not amount to much and often does quite as much harm as good but the kindness of true sympathy a thoughtful help is never without beneficent results the good temper that displays itself in kindness must not be confounded with passive goodness it is not by any means indifferent 
but largely sympathetic it does not characterize the lowest but the highest classes of society true kindness cherishes and actively promotes all reasonable instrumentalities for doing practical good in its own time and looking into futility sees the same spirit working on for the eventual elevation and happiness of the race it is the kindly disposed men who are the active men of the world while the selfish and the skeptical who have no love but for themselves are the idlers how easy is it for one benevolent being to diffuse pleasure around him and how truly is one fond heart a fountain of gladness making everything in its vicinity to freshen into smiles its effect on stern nature is like the spring rain which melts the icy covering of the earth and causes it to open to the beams of heaven in the intercourse of social life it is by the little acts of watchful kindness reoccurring daily and hourly and opportunities of doing kindness if sought for are constantly starting up it is by words by tones by gestures by looks that affection is won and preserved he who neglects these trifles yet boasts that whenever a great sacrifice is called for he shall be ready to make it will rarely be loved the likelihood is he will not make it and if he does it will be much rather for his own sake than for his neighbors life is made up not of great sacrifices or duties but of little things in which smiles and kindness and small obligations given habitually are what win and preserve the heart and secure comfort the little unremembered acts of kindness and of love are the best portion of a good man's life these little nameless acts which manifest themselves by tender and affectionate looks and little kind acts of attention do much to increase the happiness of life little kindnesses are great ones they drive away sadness and cheer up the soul beyond all common appreciation they are centers of influence over others which may accomplish much good when such kindnesses are administered in times of need they are like apples of gold in pictures of silver and will be long remembered a word of kindness in a desperate strait is as welcome as the smile of an angel and helpful hand grasp is worth a hundredfold its cost for it may have rescued for all future the most kingly thing on earth the manhood of a man it should not discourage us if our kindness is unacknowledged it has its influence still good and worthy conduct may meet with an unworthy or ungrateful return but the absence of gratitude on the part of the receiver cannot destroy the self-approbation which recompenses the giver the seeds of courtesy and kindness may be scattered around with little trouble and expense that it seems strange that more do not endeavor to spread them abroad could they but know the inward peace which requites the giver for a kindly act even though coldly received by the one to be benefited they would not hesitate to let the kindly feelings latent in us all have free expression kindly efforts are not lost some of them will invariably fall on good ground and grow up in benevolence in the minds of others and all of them will bear fruit of happiness in the bosom whence they spring it is better never to receive a kindness than not to bestow one not to return a benefit is the greater sin but not to confer it is the earlier 
the noblest revenge we can take upon our enemies is to do them a kindness to return malice for malice and injury for injury will afford but a temporary gratification to our evil passions and our enemies will only be rendered more and more bitter against us but to take the first opportunity of showing how superior we are to them by doing them a kindness or by re rendering them a service it is not only the nobler way but the sting of reproach will enter deeply into their souls and while unto us it will be a noble retaliation our triumph will not unfrequently be rendered complete not only by beating out the malice that had otherwise stood against us but by bringing repentant hearts to offer themselves the shrine of friendship a more glorious victory cannot be gained over another man than this that when the injury began on his part the kindness should begin on ours the tongue of kindness is full of pity love and comfort it speaks a word of comfort to the desponding a word of encouragement to the faint-hearted of sympathy to the bereaved of consolation to the dying urged on by a benevolent heart it loves to cheer console and invigorate the sons and daughters of sorrow kind words do not cost much they never blister the tongue or lips and no mental trouble ever arises therefrom be not saving of kind words and pleasing acts for such are fragrant gifts whose perfume will gladden the heart and sweeten the life of all who hear or receive them words of kindness fitly spoken are indeed both precious and beautiful they are worth much and cost little kind words are like the breath of the dew upon the tender plants falling gently upon the drooping heart refreshing its withered tendrils and soothing its woes bright oases are they in life's great desert who can estimate the pangs they have alleviated or the good works they have accomplished long after they are uttered do they reverberate in the soul's inner chamber and like low sweet strains of music they serve to quell the memory of bitterness or of personal wrong to lead the heart to the sunnier paths of life and when the heart is sad and like a broken harp the chords of pleasure cease to vibrate how peculiarly acceptable then are kind words from others who can rightly estimate the ultimate effect of one kind word fitly spoken one little word of tenderness gushing in upon the soul will sweep long neglected chords and awaken the most pleasant strains kind words are like jewels in the heart never to be forgotten but perhaps to cheer by their memory a long sad life while words of cruelty are like darts in the bosom wounding and leaving scars that will be borne to the grave by their victim speaking kindly in the morning it lightens all the cares of the day and makes the household and other affairs move along more smoothly speak kindly at night for it may be that before dawn some loved one may finish his or her space of life and it will be too late to ask forgiveness speak kindly at all times it encourages the downcast cheers the sorrowing and very likely awakens the erring to earnest resolves to do better with strength to keep them always leave home with kind words for they may be the last kind words are the bright flowers of earthly existence use them and especially around the fireside circle they are jewels beyond price and powerful to heal the wounded heart 
and make the weighed down spirit glad end of section forty recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c section forty one of the golden gems of life this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c the golden gems of life by emery adams allen and s c ferguson section forty one benevolence doing good is the only certain happy action of a man's life the very consciousness of well-doing is in itself ample reward for the trouble we have been put to the enjoyment of benevolent acts grows upon reflection experience teaches this so truly that never did any soul do good but he came readier to do the same again with more enjoyment never was love or gratitude or bounty practiced but with increasing joy which made the practitioner more in love with the fair act if there be a pleasure on earth which angels can not enjoy and in which they might almost envy man the possession of it it is the power of relieving distress if there be a pain which devils might almost pity man for enduring it is the deathbed reflection that we have possessed the power of doing good but that we have abused and perverted it to purposed ill he who has never denied himself for the sake of giving has but glanced at the joys of benevolence we owe our superfluity and to be happy in the performance of our duty we must exceed it the joy resulting from the diffusion of blessings to all around us is the purest and sublimest that can ever enter the human mind and can be understood only by those who have experienced it next to the consolation of divine grace it is the most sovereign balm to the miseries of life both in him who is the object of it and in him who exercises it in all other human gifts and possessions though they advance nature yet they are subject to excess for we see that by aspiring to be like god in power the angels transgressed and fell by aspiring to be like god in knowledge man transgressed and fell but by aspiring to be like god in goodness or love neither man nor angels ever did or shall transgress for unto that imitation we are called a life of passionate gratification is not to be compared with a life of active benevolence god has so constituted our natures that a man cannot be happy unless he is or thinks he is a means of doing good we cannot conceive a picture of more unutterable wretchedness than is furnished by one who knows that he is wholly useless in the world a man or woman without benevolence is not a perfect being they are a deformed personality of a true manhood or womanhood in every heart there are many tendencies to selfishness but the spirit of benevolence counteracts them all in a world like this where we are all so needy and dependent where our interests are so interlocked where our lives and hearts overlap each other and often grow together we cannot live without a good degree of benevolence we do most for ourselves when we do most for others hence our highest interests 
even from a purely selfish point of view, are in the paths of benevolence, and in a moral sense we know that it is more blessed to give than to receive. Good deeds double in the doing, and the larger half comes back to the donor. A large heart of charity is a noble thing, and the most benevolent soul lives nearest to God. Selfishness is the root of evil. Benevolence is the cure. In no heart is benevolence more beautiful than in youth. In no heart is selfishness more ugly. To do good is noble. To be good is more noble. This should be the aim of all the young. The poor and the needy should occupy a large place in their hearts. The sick and suffering should claim their attention. The sinful and criminal should awaken their deepest pity. The oppressed and downtrodden should find a large place in their compassion. Women appears in her best estate in the exercise of benevolent deeds. How sweet are her soothing words to the disconsolate! How consoling her tears of sympathy to the mourning! How fresh her spirit of hope to the discouraged! How balmy the breath of her love to the oppressed! Man, too, appears in his best light and grandest aspect when he appears as the practical follower of him who went about doing good. He who does these works of practical benevolence is educating his moral powers in the school of earnest and glorious life. He is laying the foundation for a noble and useful career. He is planting the seeds of a charity that will grow to bless and save the sufferings of our fellow man. Libertality consists less in giving profusely than in giving judiciously, for there is nothing that requires so strict an economy as our benevolence. Liberality if spread over too large a surface, produces no crop. If over one too small, it exuberates its rankness in and in weeds. And yet it requires care to avoid the other extreme. It is better to be sometimes mistaken than not to exercise charity at all. Though we may chance sometimes to bestow our benefice on the unworthy, it does not take from the merit of the act. It is not the true spirit of charity, which is ever rigid and circumspect, and which always mistrusts the truth of the necessities laid open to it. Be not frightened at the hard word, impostor. Cast thy bread upon the waters. Some have unawares entertained angels. A man should fear when he enjoys only what is good he does publicly, lest it should prove to be the publicity rather than the charity that he loves. We have more confidence in the benevolence which begins in the home and diverges into a large humanity than in the worldwide philanthropy which begins at the outside and converges into egotism. A man should, indeed, have a generous feeling for the welfare of the whole world, and should live in the world as a citizen of the world. But he may have preference for that particular part in which he lives. Charity begins at home, but it may and ought to go abroad. Still we have no respect for self-boasting charity which neglects all objects of commiseration near and around it, but goes to the end of the world in search of misery for the sake of talking about it. Generosity during life is a very different thing from generosity in the hour of death. One proceeds from genuine liberality and benevolence, the other from pride or fear. He that will not permit his wealth to do any good to others while he is living prevents it from doing any good to himself when he is gone. 
by an egotism that is suicidal and has a double edge he cuts himself off from the truest pleasures here and the highest pleasures hereafter to pass a whole lifetime without performing a single generous action till the dying hour when death unlocks the grasp upon earthly possessions is to live like the talipat palm tree of the east which blossoms not till the last year of its life it then suddenly bursts into masses of flowers but emits such an odor that the tree is frequently cut down to be rid of it even such is the life of those who postpone their monifilience until the close of their days when they exhibit a late efflorescence of generosity which lacks the sweet-smelling perfume which good deeds should possess and when it appears like the tallypat flower it is a sure sign that death is at hand they surrender everything when they see they can not continue to keep possession and are at last liberal when they can no longer be parsimonious the truly generous man does not wish to leave enough to build an imposing monument since there is so much sorrow and suffering to be alleviated they enjoy the pleasure of what they give by giving it when alive and seeing others benefited thereby a conqueror is regarded with awe the wise man commands our esteem but it is the benevolent man who wins our affection a beneficent person is like a fountain watering the earth and spreading fertility it is therefore more delightful and more honorable to give than to receive the last best fruit which comes to late perfection even in the kindest soul is tenderness toward the hard forbearance towards the unforbearant warmth of heart towards the cold philanthropy towards the misanthropic end of section forty one recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c section forty two of the golden gems of life this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The Golden Gems of Life by Emery Adams Allen and S.C. Ferguson. Section 42. Veracity. Veracity or the habitual observance of truth is a bright and shining quality on the part of any one who strives to make the most of life's possibilities it irradiates all of his surroundings making plain the path of duty and hence the path which leads to the most enduring success it is the bond of union and the basis of human happiness without this virtue there is no reliance upon language no confidence in friendship no security in promises and oaths truth is always consistent with itself and needs nothing to help it out it is always near at hand and sits upon our lips and is ready to drop out before we are aware whereas a lie is troublesome and sets a man's invention upon the rack and one trick needs many more to make it good it is dangerous to deviate far from the strict rule of veracity even on the most trifling occasions however guileless may be our intentions the habit if indulged may take root and gain on us under the cover of various pretenses till it usurps a leading influence nothing appears so low and mean as lying and dissimulation 
and it is observable that only weak animals endeavor to supply by craft the defects of strength which nature has given them dissimulation in youth is the forerunner of perfidy in old age its first appearance is the fatal omen of growing depravity and future shame it degrades parts and learning obscures the luster of every accomplishment and sinks us into contempt the path of falsehood is a perplexing maze after the first departure from sincerity it is not in our power to stop one artifice unavoidably leads on to another till as the intricacies of the labyrinth increase we are left entangled in our snare falsehood is difficult to be maintained when the materials of a building are solid stone very rude architecture will suffice but a structure of rotten materials needs the most careful adjustment to make it stand at all the love of truth and right is the grand spring source of integrity the study of truth is perpetually joined with the love of virtue for there is no virtue which derives not its original from truth as on the contrary there is no vice which has not its beginning in a lie truth is the foundation of all knowledge and the cement of all society strict veracity requires something more than merely the speaking of truth there are lying looks as well as lying words dissembling smiles deceiving signs and even a lying silence not to intend what you speak is to give your heart the lie with your tongue and not to perform what you promise is to give your tongue the lie with your actions deception exhibits itself in many forms in reticency on the one hand or exaggeration on the other in disguise or concealment in pretended a concurrence in others opinions in assuming an attitude of conformity which is deceptive in making promises or in allowing them to be implied which are never intended to be performed or even in refraining from speaking the truth when to do so is a duty there are also those who are all things to all men who say one thing and do another but those who are essentially insincere fail to evoke confidence and in the end discover that they have only deceived themselves while thinking they were deceiving others lying is in some cases the offspring of perversity and vice and in many others of sheer moral cowardice plutarch calls lying the vice of a slave there is no vice said lord bacon that so covers a man with shame as to be found false and perfidious every lie great or small is the brink of a precipice the depth of which nothing but omniscience can fathom denying a fault always doubles it all that a man can get by lying and dissembling is that he will not be believed when he speaks the truth a liar is subject to two misfortunes neither to believe nor to be believed if falsehood says montaigne like truth had but one face we should be upon better terms for we should then take the contrary of what the liar says for certain truth we are not called upon to speak all that we know that would be folly but what a man says should be what he thinks otherwise it is knavery no wrong is ever made better but always worse by a falsehood even when detection does not follow suspicion is always created wrong is but falsehood put in practice the chinese have a proverb which says a lie has no legs and cannot stand but 
it has wings and can fly far and wide you never can unite though you may try ever so hard the agonistic elements of truth and falsehood the man who forgets a great deal that has happened has a better memory than he who remembers a great deal that never happened after all the most natural beauty in the world is honesty and moral truth for all beauty is truth true features make the beauty of a face and true proportions the beauty of architecture as true measure that of harmony and music in poetry truth still is the perfection fiction must be governed by truth and can only please by its resemblance to truth the appearance of reality is necessary to agreeably represent any passion and to be able to move others we must be moved ourselves or at least seem to be so upon some probable ground falsehood itself is never so susceptible as when she baits her hook with truth and no opinions so fatally misled us as those that are not wholly wrong no watch so effectually deceives the wearer as those that are sometimes right such are the imperfections of mankind that the duplicities the temptations and infirmities that surround us have rendered the truth and nothing but the truth as hazardous and contraband as a commodity as a man can possibly deal in colton says that pure truth like pure gold has been found unfit for circulation and another has said it is dangerous to follow truth too near lest she should kick out your teeth the trouble consists in not obeying the behests of strict veracity but in lack of prudence and ordinary caution while all we tell should be the truth it is not always necessary to tell all the truth unless the other one have a right to know silence is always an alternative with truth remember that the silken cords of love must ever be linked with those of truth otherwise they will but gall and irritate instead of guiding into paths of rectitude end of section 42 recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver bc section 43 of the golden gems of life this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c the golden gems of life by emory adams allen and s c ferguson section forty three honor man of honor what a glorious title is that who would not rather have it than any that kings can bestow it is worth all the gold and silver in the world he who merits it wears a jewel within his soul and needs none upon his bosom his word is as good as his bond and if there were no law in the land one might deal just as safely with him to take unfair advantage is not in him to quibble and guard his speech so that he leads others to suppose that he means something that he does not mean even while they can never prove that it is so would be impossible to his frank nature his speeches are never riddles he looks you in the eye and says straight out the things he has to say and he does not unto others the things he would that they should do to him he is a good son and a good brother who ever heard him betray the faults and follies 
of his near kindred and with his friends he proves himself true and will not betray the trust friendship imposes on him and with strangers you do not find him too curious about the affairs of others or too eager to impart information accidentally gleaned by him real honor and esteem are not difficult to be obtained in the world they are best won by actual worth and merit rather than by art and intrigue which runs a long and ruinous race and seldom seizes upon the prize at last clear and round dealing is the honour of man's nature and mixture of falsehood is like alloy in coin of gold and silver which may make the metal work the better but it embaseth it honour like reputation and character displays itself in little acts it is of low growth anciently the romans worshipped virtue and honour as gods they built two temples which were so seated that none could enter the temple of honour without passing through the temple of virtue thus symbolizing the truth that all honour is founded on virtue he whose soul is set to do right finds himself more firmly bound by the principle of honour than by legal restraints much more at ease when bound by the law than when bound by his conscience he who is actuated by false principles of honour does not feel thus true honour is internal false honour external the one is founded on principles the other on interests the one does not ostentatiously proclaim its lofty aims it prefers that its conduct and actions demonstrate its purposes he who is moved by false honour is constantly worried lest some one should doubt that he was a man of honour he is so busily engaged in sustaining his reputation against fancied attacks on his honour that he finds but little time to devote to the exercise of those acts which a fine sense of honour would impel him to do such a one may be a libertine penurious proud may insult his inferiors and defraud his creditors but it is impossible for one possessed of true honour to be any of these honour and virtue are not the same though true honour is always founded on virtue honour may take her tones and texture from the prevailing manners and customs of those around us this renders her facilitating unless allied to virtue which is the same in both hemispheres yesterday as to-day when honour is not founded on virtue she becomes essentially selfish in design and is unworthy of her name she is then unstable and seldom the same for she feeds upon opinion and will be as fickle as her food she builds a lofty structure on the sandy foundation of the esteem of those who are of all beings the most subject to change combined with virtue she is uniform and fixed because she looks for approbation only from him who is the same at all times honour by herself is capricious in her rewards she feeds upon air and often pulls down our house to build our monument she is contracted in her views inasmuch as her hopes are rooted on to earth bounded by time and terminated by death but when directed by virtue her hopes become enlarged and magnified inasmuch as they extend beyond present things even to eternal in the storms and tempests of life mere honour is not to be depended upon 
because she herself partakes of the tumult she is also buffeted by the waves and borne along by the whirlwind but virtue is above the storm and gives to honor a sure and steadfast anchor since it is cast into heaven end of section forty three recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c section forty four of the golden gems of life this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c the golden gems of life by Emery adams allen and s c ferguson section forty four policy what is called policy is sometimes spoken of in the same sense as prudence but its nature is cunning it is a thing of many aspects and of many tongues it can appear in any form and speak in any language it is sometimes called management but is not worthy of that good name inasmuch as it is but a compound of sagacity and deceit of duplicity and of meanness it puts on the semblance of kindness and concern for your good but its heart is treachery and selfishness this principle strange as it may seem is of very extensive influence it is adopted and acted upon by multitudes who claim to be respectable and intelligent men and is not confined to the few or those of the baser sort its devotees may not be aware that this is their ruling principle of action they mistake its meaning by giving it a wrong name they call it prudence discretion wisdom alas it is not guided by the high principles of integrity which beautifully and adorn those noble attributes of perfect manhood its appropriate name is policy the sister of cunning the child of deception and duplicity this principle of double dealing of artful accommodation and management is eminently characteristic of the present age it meets every man on his blind side and by stratagem makes a tool of him to accomplish its own wily and selfish purposes if he is weak it deceives him by its artifices if he is vain it puffs up his vanity by flattery if he is a vicarious it allures him with the prospect of gain if he is ambitious it promises him promotion if he is timid it threatens him its leading maxim is the end justifies the means and in pursuing its end it sticks at nothing that promises success it may be traced in all departments of business and through all grades of society from the grand councils of the nation to the little town or parish meeting instead of acting in open daylight pursuing the direct and straightforward path of rectitude and duty you see men extensively putting on false appearances working in the dark and carrying their plans by stratagem and deceit nothing open nothing direct and honest one thing is said and another thing is meant when you look for a man in one place you find him in another with flattering lips and a double heart do they speak their language and conduct do not proceed from fixed principles and open-hearted sincerity but from a spirit of duplicity and selfish policy prudence caution and business management are not only a necessity but are commended as the price of success in worldly affairs they have the sanction of our best judgment 
and offend no moral sense of right but against mere policy every young man who has any desire of lasting respectfully and influence ought most carefully be on his guard nothing can be more fatal to reputation and success in life than to acquire the character of an artful intriguer one who does all things with the ulterior design of furthering his own ends he may succeed for a time but he will soon be found out and when found out will be despised he who acts on this principle thinks that nobody knows it but he is wretchedly mistaken the thing disguised that is thrown over the inner man is soon seen through by every one and while he prides himself on being very wise and keeping his designs out of sight all persons of the least discernment perfectly understand him and despise him for thinking he could make fools of them people often mistake policy for discretion there is a wide difference between the two traits policy is only the mimic of discretion but may pass current with the mass in the same manner as vivacity is often mistaken for wit and gravity for wisdom policy has only private selfish aims and stops at nothing which may render these successful discretion has large and extended views and like a well-formed eye commands a wide horizon policy is a kind of short insight that discovers the minutest objects that are close at hand but is not able to discover things at a distance the whole power of policy is private to say nothing and to do nothing is the utmost of its reach yet men thus narrow by nature and mean by art are sometimes able to rise by the miscarriage of bravery and openness of integrity and watching failures and snatching opportunities obtain advantages which belong to higher characters the observant man will not calculate any essential difference from mere appearances the light laughter that bubbles on the lips often mantles over brackish depths of sadness and the serious look may be the sober veil that covers a divine peace the bosom may ache beneath diamond brooches or a blithe heart dance under coarse wool sacks but a kind of fashionable discipline the eye is taught to brighten the lip to smile and the whole countenance to emanate the semblance of friendly welcome while the bosom is unwarmed by a single spark of genuine kindness and good will grief and anxiety lie hidden under the golden robes of prosperity and the gloom of calamity is often cheered by the secret radiations of hope and comfort as in the works of nature the bog is sometimes covered with flowers and the mine concealed in barren crags beware so long as you live of judging men by the outward appearance but nothing feigned or violent can last long life becomes manifest it will declare itself and at the last the worthless disguises are worn off hence the lesson that the wise men should learn is to guard against mere appearances in others but for himself to pursue the straightforward open course and in a world of deceit and intrigue show himself a man that can be relied on thus will his life be influential for good and after he is gone his memory will be revered as that of an upright man end of section forty four recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c